from the Hebrew Scriptures. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own insight. In all your ways acknowledge the Lord and the Lord will make straight your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be a healing for your flesh and a refreshment for your body. Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A selection from Paul's writings to the Corinthians. We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been granted to the churches of Macedonia. For during a severe ordeal of affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For, as I can testify, they voluntarily gave according to their means and even beyond their means, begging us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in this ministry to the saints. And this not merely as we expected. They gave themselves first to the Lord and by the will of God to us, so that we might urge Titus that as he had already made a beginning, so he should also complete this generous undertaking among you. Now as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. This is the word of the Lord. I love the cover art on our order of worship today that Mark found and placed there for us. It's called Thanksgiving Dinner and it's by Dallas artist David Bates. Uh, it's done as somewhat of an homage to Norman Rockwell's famous painting, Freedom from Want. Uh, both depict families gathered around a table ready to dig in. Uh, both suggest there's enough for everyone. And both call us to give thanks for what we have. Now, Rockwall's painting, a print of which was published, as you probably remember if you can picture it in your mind, on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. And it was made in the midst of World War II. It was inspired by President Franklin Roosevelt's inaugural address in which he listed the four freedoms. That is, freedom of speech, and worship, and freedom from want and fear. This is the third of the four. Now, Bates is an SMU alumnus who lives in my old Lake Highlands neighborhood. His rendering of Rockwell's painting is, I think, subtly different in its take on America, and one that I want to suggest to you is something we should lean into as a church. Rockwell's painting depicts America as a white family, right? Bates, who is white himself, puts a black family around the table. It's as if he is saying that America will not fulfill its highest ideals until those who have been excluded and exploited are able to be seen as fully Americans too. And even more than that, that a black family can truly represent America as America. Amen? Furthermore, Rockwell's painting is sort of a still life. It captures the moment when a turkey is about to be carved and the family at the table is simply waiting 
to receive it and to be served by the patriarch and the matriarch. In Bates's version, the table seems alive, don't you think? Where everyone at the table is sharing with everyone else at the table. Everyone's contributing because we are none of us really free until we are all giving and receiving both. I mean, it's like that way with many of our families as we'll celebrate Thursday, this Thanksgiving dinner, which will be for some of us potluck, right? Okay, grandma's green beans, mom's stuffing, can you tell I'm from the north? Right, okay. All right, dressing. I still say it should go on because if it's stuffing, it's in. All right. Uh, someone will make the gravy from a secret family recipe, right? And then there will be two versions of sweet potato casserole. The correct one from your side of the family with the melted marshmallow on top, the other from the side that married into your family and refuses to assimilate with respect to the sweet potato casserole that somehow must have crushed pecans and maple syrup on top. I don't know. And then there have to be two desserts, right, for the pecan pie lovers and the pumpkin pie lovers, right? Sorry, I've digressed from uh, Bates' painting, but I think that's also his point. That is, his table is flattened in such a way as to open it up for all of us to join, as long as we're willing to share the meal together with everybody who comes and to serve each other rather than just to be served. When the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthians, asking them to join in this generous offering to the relief work of famine-stricken siblings in the church in Jerusalem, he appeals to them to rise to the occasion. He wants them to give in a way that is actually subversive to the culture of generosity in the wider world in which they live. He wants the church to model a generosity that is rooted in gratitude for God's gifts to all that are freely given, and it will not be about what you get in return for your gift. Which is to say, if you'll excuse the reference, there really is no Quid pro quo, don't you know? (laughs) There's no such thing as the prosperity gospel. If you give to and through this church, you will have less money. (laughs) You heard it here first. God is not obligated to make you richer materially for your gift, and I won't promise you that either. But you will have everything you need, and you will be spiritually wealthy, that's for sure. If the church wants to transform society, it needs to begin by transforming itself. And to do that, we need to trace the model of generosity that was so counterculture to Paul's day and that still is in our day, right? See, too often giving comes with strings attached. Someone with resources gives to someone in need with an expectation that the one who receives is then obligated to express great gratitude to the benefactor for the generosity And this keeps the structure of rich and poor intact. The rich are praised for their gifts, and the poor are reminded that they are poor. 
The gospel reverses this. God gives freely to us all, and our thanks to God are then expressed by our sharing with one another to create a more just and equitable society, not reinforcing the imbalance and defending the injustice. I joined a few others this week in touring some of the agencies in Dallas that care for the homeless. There are many, too many, because there are too many homeless. And part of the reason there are too many homeless is that we would rather accept homelessness than provide homes for the homeless near our homes. But again, I digress. What impressed me most at places like the bridge, family gateway, the stew pot, city square, Austin Street Shelter, just to mention a few, is how they treat homeless people like people. That is, human beings first. They have names, you know, families, stories. They deserve to be treated with respect. And they are, for the most part, there. And this grows out of a transforming vision of the world that comes from the Hebrew and Christian scriptures like those we just read. You know, you can't tell a rich baby from a poor baby in a hospital nursery. Have you noticed? They're just babies until we take them home where they are then assigned arbitrary value by virtue of their address. We have to learn to trust God and to share what we have with one another as a sign of that trust. Honor God with your substance, the proverb says. With the first fruits of all you produce, that is, don't keep what you have received to yourself. Give it to the Lord by giving it to those in need. Now, today is the climax of our generation's emphasis in giving in our church. We've asked you to commit to a pattern of regular giving through the unified budget of the church, and if you're able to make additional gifts to the Pathways Endowment for uh, Pathways to Ministry Endowment Fund, that, that funds the pastoral residency program of our church that sends Uh, out to young ministers, pastors, every year into churches across the country that carries with them the values that this kind of church aspires to. The budget, though, is the primary place for our giving. It's kind of like bringing your gifts to the Thanksgiving table to be shared, and that is what we do with them we share them. So much of our giving is directed beyond our church toward our neighbors in need. It doesn't just go to build our church in this place. So let me remind you for a moment about who we are. We are not a billboard church with an ongoing marketing campaign about ourselves. We exist for others. We are not competing with other churches or criticizing them. We are modeling a different model, cooperation and neighborliness. Our goal is not to be the biggest church in town. It is to represent our faith in Jesus Christ in a way that honors God and calls everyone to the table so that everybody has a place to be honored and to serve and to be served. But to do that, we have to answer the challenge of the apostle to the Corinthian church. He said to them, you excel in so many things, 
in faith, in knowledge, in love, in speech. He wanted them to excel also in generosity. Now, we like excellence around here, too. We have high standards. We could list them all, you know. But one of our standards is low, by definition, humility. (laughs) So we won't speak more about it. But if we are to be known for something in this community, wouldn't generosity be the worthiest of goals? Paul didn't mind challenging the Corinthian church to do this. In fact, he even compared them to the Macedonian churches. I love this. And the comparison was down, not up. That is to say, he compared them to the Macedonian poverty. These poor Macedonian churches had so very little, and yet they begged for the opportunity to give, to share in the relief of the poor, the suffering saints in Jerusalem. And the Corinthians, he said, have so much more. How much more should they aspire to excel in generosity because of it? But see, it's an age-old problem that plagues us still. The poorer you are, the more you understand need and are therefore eager to give. The richer you are, the more you think the poor should fend for themselves. It's baffling, really, unless you really think about the social dynamics, you see, because the richer we become, the more ways we find to distance ourselves from people who are poorer than we are. And isolation breeds insulation, which chills our compassion and deprives generosity of motive. As we were walking into the bridge the other day, which is sort of the clearinghouse for all of these places, my Muslim friend, Amas Muscatwala, who is the executive director of Faith Forward Dallas at Thanksgiving Square, leaned over to me and said, it's important for us to be here, you know. I've been learning, she said, about becoming proximate to pain. And that comes from a phrase we have been learning from Brian Stevenson, the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama, and the author of the book, Just Mercy. See, when we become proximate to pain, we develop empathy. And that generates generosity toward those who have less. When we are only proximate to power, That generates generosity to those who have more. And this is the problem with too many Christians these days who crave access to political power. We will never become a generous church that epitomizes the good news of Jesus Christ who became poor so that others might become rich if we are always and only interested in advancing ourselves instead of providing for others. When you really understand the gospel and your place in it, you can't help but give and give and give again. Your attitude is fueled by gratitude. Your desire is for community, not privilege. You care about building a bigger and larger table for more people to share in the bounty of God's goodness. Beth Moore is a popular Bible teacher from Houston. She's an evangelical who's lately in trouble with evangelicals. Go figure. Why? Well, A, she's a woman. B, she's a woman who preaches. And C, she's a woman who's been increasingly learning to preach about how to include people rather than exclude them. In other words, She's a hen in the fox house. God bless dangerous women like that. Anyway, last month on Twitter, while she was being told to shut up and go home by a prominent male preacher, 
She took a break to talk about generosity, and she told the story lamenting this millionaire who was helping out his elderly parents who were in great need by providing them with an interest-bearing loan. Yeah. Whatever happened to generosity, she asked. And then she reflected upon what it's like being married to a man who is generous. And she told the story of how one day he came bursting into the house and said, where's the checkbook? And she said, well, what's up, babe? He said, well, I just had a pang of selfishness and I have to write a check to some charity in order to check that spirit. <laughs> Love that. Beth continued, few things on earth will make us more miserable than selfishness. Our hoarding has hardened our hearts and our love of money has robbed us blind. We are made in the image of a God who is a giver, not a taker. Scripture speaks over and over about generosity and what a grievous mistake it will have been to dishonor the poor, the widow, the orphan. We think we can hold on to our money like we can keep it, and we can't. They can stuff all our dollar bills into our caskets next to our stone-cold bodies, and we will not manage to take a single dime with us into the next life. So, if that's so, how should we live? Give. Give generously, not selfishly. Give in order to join in solidarity and friendship with others, not to be praised and singled out as being special. And so I'm asking you to join me in the worthy goal of becoming a church known for its generosity. What you do with those cards in your hands today might go a long way to curing any sickness of selfishness that will only leave you hungry of heart. The measure with which you give may be the measure of joy you will know in this life and the next. So let's excel in this generous undertaking, Wilshire. Let's be culturally subversive by being extravagantly generous as a church. It's time to take it to the next level. Who's with me?